Mr. McCoy here with part 11 of The Alchemist. As you recall, the boy had asked the alchemist, but what about me? When a person really desires something, all the universe conspires to help that person to realize his dream, said the alchemist, echoing the words of the old king. The boy understood. Another person was there to help him toward his personal legend. So, are you going to instruct me? No, you already know all you need to know. I am only going to point you in the direction of your treasure. But there's a tribal war, the boy reiterated. I know what's happening in the desert. I have already found my treasure. I have a camel, I have my money from the crystal shop, and I have 50 gold pieces. In my country, I would be a rich man. But none of that is from the pyramids, said the alchemist. I also have Fatima. She is a treasure greater than anything else I have won. She wasn't found at the pyramids either. They ate in silence. The alchemist opened a bottle and poured a red liquid into the boy's cup. It was the most delicious wine he had ever tasted. Isn't wine prohibited here? The boy asked. It's not what enters men's mouths that's evil, said the alchemist. It's what comes out of their mouths that is. Do you agree with the alchemist that it's not what enters a person's mouth that's evil, it's what comes out of it that is? Share your opinion with your fellow listener. The alchemist was a bit daunting, but as the boy drank the wine, he relaxed. After they finished eating, they sat outside the tent under a moon so brilliant that it made the stars pale. Drink and enjoy yourself, said the alchemist, noticing that the boy was feeling happier. Rest well tonight, and if you were a warrior preparing for combat, remember that wherever your heart is, there you will find your treasure. You've got to find the treasure so that everything you have learned along the way can make sense. Tomorrow, sell your camel and buy a horse. Camels are traitorous. They walk thousands of paces and never seem to tire. Then suddenly they kneel and die. But horses tire bit by bit. You always know how much you can ask of them. And when it is that, they are about to die. The following night, the boy appeared at the alchemist's tent with a horse. The alchemist was ready and he mounted his own steed and placed the falcon on his left shoulder. He said to the boy, show me where there is life out in the desert. Only those who can see such signs of life are able to find treasure. They began to ride out over the sands with the moon lighting their way. I don't know if I'll be able to find life in the desert, the boy thought. I don't know the desert that well yet. He wanted to say so to the alchemist, but he was afraid of the man. They reached the rocky place where the boy had seen the hawks in the sky, but now there was only silence and the wind. I don't know how to find life in the desert, the boy said. I know that there is life here, but I don't know where to look. Life attracts life, the alchemist answered. And then the boy understood. He loosened the reins on his horse, who galloped forward over the rocks and sand. The alchemist followed as the boy's horse ran for almost half an hour. They could no longer see the palms of the oasis, only the gigantic moon above them and its silver reflections from the stones on the desert. Suddenly, for no apparent reason, the boy's horse began to slow. There's life here, the boy said to the alchemist. I don't know the language of the desert, but my horse knows the language of life. They dismounted and the alchemist said nothing. Advancing slowly, they searched among the stones. The alchemist stopped abruptly and bent to the ground. There was a hole there among the stones. The alchemist put his hand into the hole and then his entire arm up to his shoulder. Something was moving there and the alchemist's eye, the boy could see only his eyes, squinted with his effort. His arm seemed to be battling with whatever was in the hole. Then, with a motion that startled the boy, he withdrew his arm and leaped to his feet. In his hand, he grasped a snake by the tail. The boy leapt as well, but away from the alchemist. The snake fought frantically, making hissing sounds that shattered the silence of the desert. 
It was a cobra whose venom could kill a person in minutes. Watch out for his venom, the boy said, but even though the alchemist had put his hand in the hole and had surely already been bitten, his expression was calm. The alchemist is 200 years old, the Englishman had told him. He must know how to deal with the snakes of the desert. The boy watched as his companion went to his horse and withdrew a scimitar. With its blade, he drew a circle in the sand, and then he placed the snake within it. The serpent relaxed immediately. Not to worry, said the alchemist. He won't leave the circle. You found life in the desert, the omen that I needed. So what do you think is going to happen now? Share your prediction with your fellow listener. Why was that so important? Because the pyramids are surrounded by the desert. The boy didn't want to talk about the pyramids. His heart was heavy, and he had been melancholy since the previous night. To continue his search for the treasure meant that he had to abandon Fatima. I'm going to guide you across the desert, the alchemist said. I want to stay in the oasis, the boy answered. I found Fatima, and as far as I'm concerned, she's worth more than treasure. Fatima is a woman of the desert, said the alchemist. She knows that men have to go away in order to return, and she already has her treasure. It's you. Now she expects that you will find what it is that you're looking for. Well, what if I decide to stay? Let me tell you what will happen. You'll be the counselor of the desert. You have enough gold to buy many sheep and many camels. You'll marry Fatima and you'll both be happy for a year. You'll learn to love the desert and you'll get to know every one of the 50,000 palms. You'll watch them as they grow, demonstrating how the world is always changing. And you'll get better and better at understanding omens because the desert is the best teacher there is. Sometime during the second year, you'll remember about the treasure. The omens will begin insistently to speak of it, and you'll try to ignore them. You'll use your knowledge for the welfare of the oasis and its inhabitants. The tribal chieftains will appreciate what you do, and the camels will bring you wealth and power. During the third year, the omens will continue to speak of your treasure and your personal legend. You'll walk around night after night at the oasis, and Fatima will be unhappy because she'll feel it as she who interrupted your quest. But you will love her, and she'll return your love. You'll remember that she never asked you to stay because a woman of the desert knows that she must wait for her man. So you won't blame her, but many times you'll walk the sands of the desert, thinking that maybe you could have left, that you could have trusted more in your love for Fatima because what kept you at the oasis was your own fear that you might never come back. At that point, the omens will tell you that your treasure is buried forever. Then, sometime during the fourth year, the omens will abandon you because you've stopped listening to them. The tribal chieftains will see that, and you'll be dismissed from your position as counselor. But by then, you'll be a rich merchant with many camels and a great deal of merchandise. You'll spend the rest of your days knowing that you didn't pursue your personal legend and that now it's too late. You must understand that love never keeps a man from pursuing his personal legend. If he abandons that pursuit, it's because it wasn't true love, the love that speaks the language of the world. The alchemist erased the circle in the sand and the snake slithered away among the rocks. The boy remembered the crystal merchant who had always wanted to go to Mecca and the Englishman in search of the alchemist. He thought of the woman who had trusted in the desert, and he looked out over the desert that had brought him to the woman he loved. They mounted their horses, and this time it was the boy who followed the alchemist back to the oasis. The wind brought the sounds of the oasis to them, and the boy tried to hear Fatima's voice. But that night, as he had watched the cobra within the circle, a strange horseman, with the falcon on his shoulder had spoken of love and treasure, of the women of the desert, and of his personal legend. I'm going with you, the boy said, and he immediately felt peace in his heart. We'll leave tomorrow before sunrise, was the alchemist's only response. 
So how does this fit into your own personal life? Have you ever wanted something but were afraid to pursue it or you got distracted by something else and then regretted not pursuing what you wanted? Share your own situation with those nearest you. The boy spent a restless, sleepless night. Two hours before dawn, he awoke one of the boys who slept in his tent and asked him to show him where Fatima lived. They went to her tent, and the boy gave his friend enough gold to buy a sheep. Then he asked his friend to go into the tent where Fatima was sleeping and to awaken her and tell her that he was waiting outside. The young Arab did as he was asked and was given enough gold to buy yet another sheep. Now leave us alone, said the boy to the young Arab. The Arab returned to his tent to sleep, proud to have helped the counselor of the oasis and happy at having enough money to buy himself some sheep. The team appeared at the entrance to the tent. The two walked out among the palms. The boy knew that it was a violation of the tradition, but that that didn't matter to him now. I'm going away, he said and I want you to know that I'm coming back. I love you because... Don't say anything, Fatima interrupted. One is loved because one is loved. No reason is needed for loving. But the boy continued, I had a dream, and I met with a king. I sold crystal and crossed the desert, and because the tribes declared war, I went to the well, seeking the alchemist. So I love you because the entire universe conspired to help me find you. The two embraced. It was the first time either had touched the other. I'll be back, the boy said. Before this, I always looked to the desert with longing, said Fatima. Now it will be with hope. My father went away one day, but he returned to my mother, and he has always come back since then. They said nothing else. They walked a bit farther among the palms, and then the boy left her at the entrance to her tent. I'll return, just as your father came back to your mother, he said. He saw that Fatima's eyes were filled with tears. You're crying? I'm a woman of the desert, she said, averting her face. But above all, I'm a woman. Fatima went back to her tent, and when daylight came, she went out to do the chore she had done for years but everything had changed. The boy was no longer at the oasis, and the oasis would never again have the same meaning, and it had only yesterday. It would no longer be a place with 50,000 palm trees and 300 wells where the pilgrims arrived, relieved at the end of their long journeys. From that day on, the oasis would be an empty place for her. From that day on, it was the desert that would be important. She would look to it every day and would try to guess which star the boy was following in search of his treasure. She would have to send her kisses on the wind, hoping that the wind would touch the boy's face and would tell him that she was alive, that she was waiting for him, a woman waiting, awaiting a courageous man in search of his treasure. From that day on, the desert would represent only one thing to her, the hope for his return. There's a little more for today, but what do you suppose is going to happen next? Share with those next to you. And now, a couple minutes more of The Alchemist. Don't think about what you've left behind, the alchemist said to the boy as they began to ride across the sands of the desert. Everything is written in the soul of the world, and there it will stay forever. Men dream more about coming home than about leaving, the boy said. He was already accustomed or reaccustomed to the desert silence. If what one finds is made of pure matter, it will never spoil, and one can always come back. If what you had found was only a moment of light like the explosion of a star, you would find nothing on your return. The man was speaking the language of alchemy, but the boy knew that he was referring to Fatima. It was difficult not to think about what he had left behind. The desert, with its endless monotony, put him to dreaming. The boy could still see the palm trees, the wells, and the face of the woman he loved. He could see the Englishman at his experiments and the camel driver who was a teacher without realizing it. Maybe the alchemist has never been in love, the boy thought. The alchemist rode in front with the falcon on his shoulder. 
The bird knew the language of the desert well, and whenever they stopped, he flew off in search of game. On the first day, he returned with a rabbit, and on the second, with two birds. At night, they spread their sleeping gear and kept their fires hidden. The desert nights were cold and were becoming darker and darker as the phases of the moon passed. They went on for a week, speaking only of the precautions they needed to follow in order to avoid the battles between the tribes. The war continued, and at times the wind carried the sweet, sickly smell of blood. Battles had been fought nearby, and the wind reminded the boy that there was the language of the omens, always ready to show him what his eyes had failed to observe. On the seventh day, the alchemist decided to make camp earlier than usual. The falcon flew off to find game, and the alchemist offered his water container to the boy. You are almost at the end of your journey, said the alchemist. I congratulate you on having pursued your personal legend. More of the journeys of the boy and the alchemist as the alchemist continues.